Would you imagine that uh, you had a friend whose father owned a service station? And you'd known the friend for years, but you never met his father. And your friend uh, got a scholarship to a, a, an out-of-state college. And before he left, he uh, introduced you to his father, explaining that uh, it would be good, since you were just starting out on your own job life, you could get your car serviced there and you could open an account with his dad at the service station. And so you did that. But you were just starting out on your own job life, and it was the first time you'd had your own money to manage for yourself. And so you began to find those old difficulties. You overstretched yourself financially, and you were always intending to pay that account that you had at the service station. But week would go by, and week would go by, and you'd keep getting gas and oil at the service station, and yet you wouldn't pay the monthly account. And they just pile up in your apartment. And more and more you'd feel worse and worse about your relationship with your friend's dad. This was a man that you didn't want to be alienated from. You wanted to have a good relationship with him for the sake of your friend. But really, you got more and more concerned and more and more embarrassed when you went to the station each day for gas. Until eventually you decided the easiest thing is to avoid the problem altogether and you just stop going and the whole thing lay heavy on your conscience because you had a massive bill there and yet you couldn't do anything about it and then the summertime came and your friend came home from school and you explained the whole miserable story to him and he said that's okay I'll make it right with my dad and you said to him, no, no, I, I've, just, I've just blown the whole thing. I've just spoiled the relationship completely. But the next day, your friend came to see you and he said, it's okay. Everything's all right. I've made things right with my dad. You can go back and you can get your gas there. And you were hesitant at the beginning, you know, and didn't feel really that anything could have made that mess right. The bills were so big. And yet, two or three days later, you decided, well, I'll go back and I'll get my gas there. And you drove into the station, and the dad came out, and he saw you, and he said, really good to see you. Really good to see you. Boy, you know, I, I, for a while, I didn't know what to think of you. But my son, he paid all your bills, and if my son trusts you that much, then I trust you. Now, I hope you come back and you get all you want here. And suddenly the whole thing is right. Now, do you see that you had only confidence to go back to the service station because you really believed what your friend said. You believed that he had made everything right, even though it seemed impossible for anybody to make it right. You believed that he had made things right with, your, with his father. Now, do you see it's the same with us? It's the same with us. You are right with the creator of the world when you believe what Jesus has said. And Jesus has said, listen, I have made things right. I've made things right with my Father, and you can go to him and get all that you need from him, and you need not fear. And brothers and sisters, that's what we mean by saying that a person is made right with God by faith. Simply that by believing, by having faith that Jesus has actually made everything right with your father, everything is right. And then going to your father with complete confidence and receiving from him whatever you need. Now, that's being justified by faith. And the, the kind of faith, you remember, it's described, if you like to look at it there in Romans 4 and uh, verse 18. We've been talking about it oh, over a couple of months anyway. But Romans 4 and 18 describes it. It's the kind of faith that old Abraham had in God. Romans 4 and 18, it's page 980. 980. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, 
so shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, because he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. And that's at 422. Just he believed that God would rejuvenate Sarah's body and would enable her, even though she was 90 years of age, to have a baby. Just the way we would go to the service station and even though everything seemed impossible and it seemed impossible that this man should deal with us at all generously, yet we would de go back in complete confidence that the son had made everything right with the father and we would go expecting to receive so old Abraham went to God expecting him to rejuvenate Sarah's body and to give life to the old dead body. Now do you see that the problem was not Abraham's inability to believe that God could do it? That was no problem. Abraham knew that God was the, people who was the one who raised people from the dead. He knew that God was the one who stretched the galaxies and the stars across the heavens. He knew that God could do it. Abraham's difficulty was, would God do it? Would God give supernatural, uncreated life to his wife? And why did he have any problem believing that? Because he knew that in the old ancient days, the old father of mankind, Adam, had defied God and had refused God's uncreated life away at the beginning of the world. He knew that Adam had said to God, no, I live on my own resources and my own way for my own purposes. And Abraham knew through what his uh, predecessors had told him that because of that, God had pulled back this eternal uncreated life from man's power and from any opportunity of him receiving it. And so Abraham knew that that was man's situation. He remembered, you see, what you and I read in, oh, Genesis 2 it is, if you like to look at it, Genesis 3 and verse uh, 24. Abraham knew this had happened, that uh, mankind had uh, defied God and said, we'll do without your life. And because of that, God had withdrawn his life from them, as it says in 24 there, it's page 3 in the, in the Black God is V, page 3. And Genesis 3 and 24 he drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And old Abraham knew that. He knew that there was no reason on earth why this man should extend any more credit to him. He knew there was no reason on earth why this creator should give him uncreated life, why he should turn back the, the process of death in his wife's womb. Because he, along with all the rest, had defied God. And this had been worked out, you see. Abraham knew the stories of the flood. He knew how God had proved to man again and again, look, I'm finished with you. God had mowed them all down in the flood. had said, look, you've defied me. I am not giving you eternal life. Look at this life that is dying now in the midst of the flood. This isn't eternal, uncreated life. This is dying life. And Abraham knew that. He knew the great judgments of God that had come upon mankind by which God had impressed upon man again and again. Look, the life you have is not uncreated spiritual life that can turn a woman's womb of 90 into a womb of 35. It isn't that kind of life that you have. It's a death life that you have now because you've defied me. And yet, you see, Abraham was faced with one problem. And you might like to look at it. It's in Genesis 6 and verse 18. Genesis 6 and verse 18. 17, you see, is the way God treated mankind after he had defied him, and Abraham knew that in 17. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, and which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But this is what baffled Abraham in verse 18. But I will establish my covenant with you. And God was speaking to Noah. And you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And Abraham was faced with the problem that God hadn't destroyed Noah. 
And dear ones, I don't know how Abraham knew it, you know, because there was no cross raised on Calvary at that time. But somehow Abraham knew that there had been a lamb slain from the foundation of the world in place of Noah. And because of that lamb that had been slain from the foundation of the world instead of Noah, God was able to give his life to those people who believed that. And it was because Abraham grasped that through the revelation of the Holy Spirit in his spirit that someone had already died in his place and that God was therefore free to make available his life to any man who believed that, it was because of that that Abraham was able to believe that God would rejuvenate Sarah, his wife. Do you see that that's what is needed by us? Do you see, there are thousands of us in this world who feel alienated from the being behind the universe and feel alienated from each other. And so many of us, you know, are trying to remove this sense of alienation by proving that we're good or proving that it's worth God's while giving us all the things that we need or proving that it's other people's worthwhile. It's worth their while to give us the respect that we ought to have. But do you see that that's why Christianity has turned out so many moral do-gooders? There are so many people trying to prove, look, we're good enough to receive your life, God. We're good enough. We're good enough. Do you see that it's not a matter of being good enough? It's believing that some son has made things right between you and his father. It's believing that some son has died for the things, the defiance that you have shown to God. And that because that son has died for that, the father no longer treats you as a rebel. He no longer treats you as somebody who's defiant. He treats you as somebody that he has no reason to withhold his life from. You see, this morning, loved ones, the Father is bending over you and me and saying, look, my children, I really love you. I know you've done things that should make me condemn you to death, but don't you see that my son has died that death for you? And I have no reason to withhold anything that you need from you. I'm willing to give you anything you need. And you see, we're sort of crouching down and saying, oh, oh but uh, I'm not good enough. But do you see that Abraham wasn't good enough? Abraham continued in dishonest ways even after God dealt with him. But Abraham did believe that there had been a slam slain from the foundation of the world who had died in his place and had made it possible for God to remain a just God and yet forgive people who had rebelled against him. And that's our situation. You know. And there are a thousand voices, you know, from our parents up through our school teachers to our professors at university, everybody's trying to say the same thing. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. Loved ones, it isn't a case of being good enough. Do you see that? Christianity isn't first and foremost a case of being moral and goody-goody. Christianity is first and foremost seeing that you deserve death. You don't deserve a thing from God's hand. But because his son has died for you, the father has changed everything. He's willing to give you anything you want. Now, do you see, going back to the service station, that there would have been no relationship between you and your friend's father if you had not sooner or later gone back to that station for gas? Do you see that? It was no use you saying, oh, yeah, Tom or John or whatever his name was, I believe you've made things right with your father. Still, I'll deal with fish scaly. <laughs> That's the advantage. You can do commercials that way <laughs> It was no use you saying, you see, no, I believe you've made things right, but I'm not going back to that station. The only way a relationship was possible between you and the father was when you actually drove that car back into the station and went there for gas. Now, do you see that's what's wrong with so many of us? There's so many of us saying, oh, I believe in Jesus. I believe that Jesus has done something that enables his father to be my friend. I believe that Jesus has done something that enables God to give me anything I need but we never go to him. We never go to him. We keep singing every Sunday, yeah, I believe Jesus died so that God could give me the tree of life. I believe Jesus died so that God could give me health. I believe Jesus died so that God could meet my financial needs, but we never go to God for those. And so we never have a relationship with him. Now, loved ones, being justified by faith is not only believing that something has happened on the cross and Calvary to enable God to be open and generous to you, but it's a business of trusting God, treating God as a dear, loving Father. 
See, it's as if God is behind that curtain there and he's trying to get through to you and he's trying to say, look, look, my hands are open to you. And you're saying, okay, stay there, stay there. I believe that, I believe that. But I'm not going to treat you like that. Now, do you see the Father wants you to treat him as a dear loving father? Now, that means, you see, that you begin to turn from your own resources. That's part of being justified by faith, that you turn from your own resources. Now, would you look at uh, just a, a record of Abraham's life that would illustrate it? Genesis 13 and verses 2 through 9. Genesis 13 and 2 through 9. It's page 10 the ones in the RSV. Page 10 and Genesis 13 and verse 2. Now, Abraham was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. And he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and I to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord, and Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. That was the problem. For their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. At that time the Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelt in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen, is not the whole land before you. Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right, or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. Now that's treating God as your loving Father. Not grabbing at everything that you can, but trusting God to give you what you need. In other words, if you're really treating God as a dear loving father this morning, you'll stop being covetous, you see? You'll stop grabbing at everything that you can get hold of, either in your job or from your roommate. You'll really believe that this dear loving father will give you whatever you need. And therefore you won't have any need to grab and be greedy and be covetous. And loved ones, then you don't have to worry about your financial resources. You don't have to be troubled about, will I get this or will he get that? But you're willing to do what Abraham said. Okay, you take the best land, then I'll take this land. Okay, you take the stuff to your right, I'll take the stuff to my left. But do you see, Abraham treated God as a dear loving father who would give him whatever he needed. And that's being justified by faith. Now, loved ones, you see, it's the same with ourselves. It means turning from our own resources. Okay, so you need energy, so you turn from the caffeine. That's it. You just turn from the caffeine. You don't have four cups so that you'll have enough energy for the day. You turn from your own resources and you trust God, your dear loving Father, to give you all the energy you need. So you don't need to drink all that coffee to produce all that energy. You don't need to depend on your own resources. You don't need to depend on the old tranquilizers for peace. You turn from your own resources. Loved ones, that's proof that you're trusting your father, you see. There's no point in going to fish scaly if you really trust your loving father. If you trust this son to have made things right with his father, then you'll go to his service station. Now, do you see that going to tranquilizers is going to another service station? And if God is a dear loving father who will give you whatever you need, then he'll give you peace when you need it. He'll give you peace. And he expects you to turn from your own resources of peace and to turn to him for his peace. It's the same with the whole business of sex and lust, you know. Is the father not able to give us a sense of eternity? Is he not able to give us a sense of exhilaration through his spirit? Or does the father expect us to go to some other service station to get those things? You see, God expects us to show that we trust him as a dear loving father by turning from our own resources for getting exhilaration or getting a sense of eternity and going to him and trusting him for that. And you know, I mean, it's the same with the old heroine. It's the same for that desire, for that sense of transcendence, you know. Or going to the Eastern religions for that sense of transcendence to try to get away from this creeping pedestrian world. Is the father not able to give you that sense of transcendence himself through his spirit? Well, do you see that if you really believe that Jesus has done something that enables your creator to give you whatever you need, you prove that 
by turning from your own resources and going to his. And you know it means not only turning from your own resources in that way, but turning from your own resources as far as defending your own life is concerned. Uh, there's a piece in Abraham's life which brings it out. If you look at Genesis 14 and verse 21, Genesis 14 and 21, Abraham had just won a battle, you remember, Genesis 14 and 21. And the king of Sodom, it's page 11, and the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, maker of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours, lest you should say I have made Abraham rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eschol, and Mamre take their share. Abraham was justified in taking his share of the spoils. But do you see when you trust God as your dear loving father, you don't even need to take what is your right. So you don't need to get indignant to defend yourself. You don't need to get that old indignant when indignation when somebody takes advantage of you. You say, no, I trust my father to guard me. I trust my father to defend me. You don't need to get angry to ensure that they give you the respect that is your due. No, I trust my father to give me whatever I need. You don't need to get selfish to try to protect yourself in this weird world. You trust the Father to give you whatever you need. You see, it means turning from all your own resources and turning to the Father and trusting him to give you what you need. Not taking anything from anybody else which you can get from him. And then it means, you know, doing what Abraham did. It means putting yourself into positions that are only reasonable if God is a dear loving Father. It means that. It means putting yourself into positions and situations that are only reasonable, even half reasonable, if God is a dear loving father who will come through every time. And there's an instance in Abraham's life, you know, Genesis 12 it is, and verses 1 through 4. Genesis 12 and 1 through 4. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, that I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses you I will curse. And by you all the families of the earth shall bless themselves. That was what God was asking Abraham to trust them for. And verse 4, So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And you remember, went out not knowing whether he went. Now do you see, God is asking you and me to go out onto that kind of life. It means committing yourself to a Christian core, to something, to some outreach for God, to something that is way beyond anything that your own resources can face, and trusting your God to come through with all that you need. Now, that's what justifying faith is about. Loved ones, it is not, it is not, I, I have great respect for Bloomington. Bloomington is a lovely place. But it is not getting a little house in Bloomington getting enough life insurance and social security to protect you and your children and the dog and staying there for 50 long years. That is not it. It is trusting the Father. It is going out into situations that are only half reasonable if God is a dear, loving Father who will give you whatever you need. That is what it means to be justified by faith, you see. And then God looks down and he sees not a bunch of people singing hymns and saying, we believe you, Lord, we believe you, Lord. But he sees a group of heroes and heroines who are going out into situations that require his supplies and his resources and require him to prove to all the world that he has nothing against men and that he will give them whatever they need because of Jesus. Now, you know, where do you stand yourself? think what we need to do is be sensible. If you see some areas of your life this morning where you have been turning to your own resources, and therefore where it cannot be said of you, that's why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, then you should say that this morning to God. You, see. you should say, Father, I see. I've been talking big, but I've been acting small. So, Father, I'm turning from my own resources there from this, from this day on, and I'm going to trust you for these resources. And really, that's what God wants today, you know. But he doesn't want a whole lot of high and mighty resolves 
and beautiful aspirations and holy intentions. He wants us to settle some things with him today. You know. If you've been going to the old caffeine for energy, you know, more energy to face the day. You know. Or the old tranquilizers just to steady my nerves, to steady my nerves. Well, then, if you've been doing that, then go to the Father. If you've been trying to defend yourself all the time instead of trusting him to defend you, then God wants you to put a stake in the ground today about that, you know. But, you see, that's the kind of faith that is counted as righteousness. That's the kind of faith that makes us right with God, where you actually go to the right service station and you receive what he is willing to give you. And that's God's wish for us, you know. And you'll find him the same as we find him. He is a dear, loving father. And he will give you whatever you need. And he will provide every need of yours. He knows your needs. You know your luxuries. He knows your needs. But he will supply all our needs. And really, he has nothing against us because of Jesus, you know. So I really pray that someone anyway this morning will begin to see that there's a higher way to go. And will begin to go that way. And, and trust God as their father, you know.